wishing you a great day today we'll be discussing on the physiology of urinary system part 1 in this lecture you should be able to list out the functions of kidneys you will be describing the structural unit of kidney the nephron you will be defining the glomerular filtration rate and its normal values you will be also explaining the various factors affecting the glomerular filtration rate or gfr you will be describing the juxta glomerular apparatus and its functions let us now see the functions of kidney kidney is important to filter the blood plasma to eliminate the waste materials from the blood kidney also regulates the blood volume and blood pressure it is an important organ to regulate the body fluid osmolarity the hormone renin which is secreted from kidney plays an important role in blood pressure regulation the hormone erythropoietin which is secreted from kidney plays an important role in the red blood cell production or erythropoiesis it is having a role in carbon dioxide regulation in the body through its acid base balance kidney plays an important role in the activation of vitamin d to activated form which is called as 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol kidney has an important role to detoxify the free radicals and drugs during stages of starvation the glucose production will be happening in the kidney by the process of gluconeogenesis kidney plays an important role to maintain the constancy of extracellular fluid volume and thereby it maintains the homeostasis kidney is having rich blood supply approximately 20 to 25 percentage of the cardiac output goes to the kidney it is also having an important role in removing the substances from plasma this schematic diagram represents the blood flow in the kidney we can appreciate that it is initiated from a direct branch coming from the aorta which forms the renal artery so the pressure system inside the aorta is quite high so in the renal artery also the blood pressure is quite high we need to know that this particular structure is mainly involved or this particular organ is mainly involved in the filtration process so we need to have the filtration under high pressure sometimes it is also called as ultra filtration glomerular ultra filtration that means the filtration is taking place under high pressure because it's a direct branch of aorta then it divides into segmental artery lobar artery interlobar artery arcuate artery interlobular artery then it forms the efferent arteriole through which the blood enters into the tuft of capillary which is called as glomerulus and from this tuft of capillaries the blood which is leaving it is called efferent arterioles it then forms peritubular capillaries in the case of cortical nephrons and if you are talking about the juxta medullary nephron then it will be the vasa recti so there are two types of nephrons which we will be seeing later but remember peritubular capillaries supplies the cortical nephrons which is seen towards the nephron seen towards the cortical regions and the juxta medullary nephrons which are seen towards the interior part that will be supplied by the vasa recti then it forms the interlobular vein arcuate vein interlobar vein renal vein and joins back into the inferior vena cava nephrons are the structural and functional units of kidney 
we have about 25 million nephrons in two kidneys and it is responsible for the formation of urine the main structure of nephrons includes glomerulus vas which is the vascular component and also the renal tubule which process them and makes the urine let us now go through the structure of a nephron which is the functional unit of kidney here you can see a structure which is called as a Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule is the structure to which the filtration will be taking place. And the filtration will be taking place in a tuft of capillaries which is called as a glomerulus. Glomerulus is the tuft of capillaries. So through the eff efferent arteriole, through the efferent arteriole, blood will be entering into the glomerulus and it will be leaving through the efferent arteriole. So efferent arteriole will be taking the blood into the glomerulus, which is the tuft of capillaries here. And then it will be leaving through the efferent, cap efferent arteriole. And the outer covering, this particular capsule, that is called as a Bowman's capsule. So filtration will be occurring into the Bowman's capsule. So filtration from the glomerulus will enter into the Bowman's capsule. Then you have the next part, which is called as a proximal convoluted tubule. Convolution means it is coiling. So you can see that this is a coiled structure, convoluted structure. So pro proximal convoluted tubule or PCT. Then it is extended as a proximal straight tubule where there is no convolution. It is straight tubule. So proximal convoluted tubule followed by proximal tubule, proximal straight tubule. Then we have the descending limb of loop of Henle. This part is called as a loop of Henle. The whole thing is a loop of Henle, but it is a descending limb of the loop of Henle. Then it comes here. It is going up, which is the ascending thin limb of loop of Henle. See, thin ascending limb of loop of Henle because this is thin. And when you go up, when you go, go up, you can see that this part is thicker. So this part is called as a thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Then again, it becomes coiled, which is the convolution. So you can see this structure is called as a distal convoluted tubule. So distal convoluted tubule. So convolution means it is coiling then it will be joining into the collecting duct. So that is the structure of a nephron. These are the parts of the nephrons which were shown in that particular picture. Renal corpuscle which includes the, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule together. Proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule is the coiled structure. Proximal straight tubule. Together we call it as a proximal tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule or PCT and proximal straight tubule together this is called as a proximal tubule. Descending thin limb, ascending thin limb, thick ascending limb together constitutes the loop of Henle. Then comes the distal convoluted tubule. Again, it is a coil structure which will be passing through the efferent and efferent arteriole. Then it joins the collecting duct. So these are the parts of the nephrons which you need to remember. This is a structure of a glomerulus. So you can see in this particular part also the efferent arteriole is entering, it is taking the blood into the tuft of capillaries which is called as glomerulus. When it is going out, it is called as efferent arteriole. This is a cut section of the distal convoluted tubule where it is making a connection between, when it goes in between the, through the efferent and efferent arteriole, it touches and make a connection. So this will be discussed later, but it has got a physiological significance. For the time being, you need to remember that it is in close proximity, close contact with efferent and efferent arteriole. So that is the distal tubule. Glomerulus, a specialized capillary bed is seen there. The renal corpuscle 
the glomerulus sits with a glomerular capsule the first part of the renal tubule so that part the usually this is called as a renal corpuscle renal corpuscle means it is actually the whole thing with the bowman's capsule and the glomerulus then you can see the efferent and efferent arteriole and also one thing you need to appreciate that the arteriole the efferent and arteriole the size wise it is slightly different though you cannot see it clearly in this picture but you need to remember that the efferent arteriole is narrow when compared to the efferent arteriole so the blood when it is going inside it is the diameter of that particular efferent arteriole is larger larger diameter but when the blood is going out coming out it is having a narrow narrow bore diameter narrow if for though the efferent arteriole is narrow and efferent arteriole is broader or larger renal tubule so you can see that the bowman's capsule is there then proximal convoluted tubule loop of henle distal tubule so all these pictures you need to remember all the structure of the nephrons the entire structure of the nephron in the first picture whatever is given that you need to remember now let us look into the cortical nephrons cortical nephron so here you can see these nephrons are called as cortical nephrons because it is localized in the renal cortex cortex means it's the outer part and the inner part is called as a medulla so you can see that this is the renal medulla and this is the cortex and this set of nephrons which is isolated or located within that cortical region they are the cortical nephrons and juxtra medullary nephrons will be extending their loop of henle deeper into the renal medulla so this one will be extending deeper into the renal medulla whereas here this is confined to the renal cortex so there are two types of nephrons the cortical nephrons and the juxtra medullary nephrons about 85 percentage of the total nephron is composed of the cortical nephron so the majority of the nephrons what we see in the kidney is cortical nephrons and only 15 percentage of the nephrons what you see will be the juxtra medullary nephron cortical nephron so this as per i mentioned the glomeruli of the cortical nephron lie in the outer layer of the cortex they have short loops of henle if you see this is the loop of henle they are short but here you see the loop of henle is very long right so this is the difference Vascular supply is by the peritubular capillary. That is also different. You know, different. The vascular supply is also the efferent arteriole will be forming the peritubular capillaries in the case of a cortical nephrons. Now the juxtra medullary nephrons. The juxtra medullary nephrons, they are seen in the junction of the cortex and the medulla almost but the loop of henle will be extending deeper into the renal medulla it comprises 15 percent of the total nephron located at the junction of cortex and medulla longer loop of henle and the vascular supply is by vasa recti that means this particular part this particular um, after the efferent arteriole the blood vessels which is coming out instead of being the peritubular capillary this is slightly modified peritubular capillaries which are known as a vasa recti that means when you compare to the cortical nephrons you you will say that it is the vascular supply is by the peritubular capillaries but here you need to say that the vascular supply is by vasa recti which is a modified peritubular capillaries these are the functional divisions of a nephron this is a very important slide to know filtrating segment bowman's capsule where the filtration is taking place that we call it as a filtrating segment then comes the conserving segment which is the proximal tubule conserving segment 
Then comes the concentrating segment, which is the loop of Henle, where the concentration will be taking place. Concentration of the urine will be taking place. So filtration segment, the filtration will be there. Conserving segment, because majority of the substances will be reabsorbed back into the blood. We will see first see that many of the substances will be filtered. These filtered substances, many of the substances will be reabsorbed back into the blood. For example, glucose. Glucose is filtered in the glomerular filtrating membrane, but it is 100% reabsorbed back into the proximal tubule because we will be seeing that in a normal individual, no traces of glucose will be found in the urine. So it's a conserving segment. It reabsorbs re whatever is essential to the body. Concentrating segment is by the loop of Henle, which is the one which is involved in the concentration ability of the kidney. Then comes the regulating segment, which is the late distal tubule and the collecting duct, which means that under the influence of hormones, these segments can alter or change the reabsorption. For example, ADH, aldosterone, these kind of hormones can act on the kidney and it can change the reabsorption pattern. If aldosterone acts, it can reabsorb the sodium. If ADH acts on the kidney, it can reabsorb the water. So regulating segment is based on the hormone. Remember that other areas, other parts of the nephron doesn't have these receptors for these hormones. So regulating segment is exclusively for the late distal tubule and for the collecting duct, but you will not be seeing this uh, hormonal action in the proximal tubule and other regions because of the lack of receptors. This picture explains about the basic steps involved in urine formation. From this picture, you can see that glomerulus, which is the tuft of capillaries, is the area where the filtration is taking place. Filtration will be taking place and the filtrate will move to this particular part which is called as a Bowman's capsule. Then it will be moving through the tubules where the reabsorption of necessary substances will be taking place. Reabsorption of necessary substances to the blood will be taking place which is to the peritubular capillaries. Then some of the materials will be secreted back into the blood, into, into the tubule, and then unwanted materials will be excreted out in the urine. So this is the part where the urine is formed, this tubule where the urine is formed, but it is actually a part formed from the blood and it is modified. That means the filtration of the blood will be taking place, the plasma part, of the blood will be filtered and then you will be seeing that reabsorption of some substances will be taking place some substances will be added then remaining things will be excreted out so it includes these four basic steps filtration reabsorption secretion and excretion so this as a picture just shows the comparison between the route taken by the blood and the route taken by the filtrate. So that is the comparison you can see from this particular picture. Let us learn about the glomerular filtration which occurs in the renal corpuscle. The filtration membrane consists of fenestrated endothelium which means it is having some kind of spaces through which it can send certain particles. They exclude the cell. The cells cannot be passing through the fenestrated endothelium. So it is having a fenestration means it is pores. You can see these are the fenestrations. You can see here there is a fenestration. So this kind of fenestrated endothelium is seen in the kidney. It is different from the other endothelium where it is continuous. If you are seeing any other capillaries, the endothelial cells will be continuous Whereas in the case of kidney, you will be seeing that these capillaries will be fenestrated capillaries of which is having small gaps or pore sizes here. See, these are the small gaps. There is a basement membrane 
or in the glomerule. This is the basement membrane. You can see this particular part, which is the basement membrane, this gray colored, this one. Can you appreciate that? This gray, gray colored layer, that is the basement membrane. And this is made up of certain proteins which are negatively charged. These proteins are negatively charged. That means it will repel the negatively charged ions to pass through it. These membrane, these pro, pro, because of these special proteins, this basement membrane is highly charged, highly negatively charged. So because of this negatively charged, what will happen is it will repel the negatively charged substances to go through it. The filtration slits between the pedicels and podocytes. Then you will be seeing that these are certain projections which is coming from the other side, which forms as food plates or podocytes. These are the penetrators. So this part is coming from the Bowman's capsule side. So from the Bowman's capsule, this kind of projections will be forming, which are called as the pedicels and the podocytes. See the food process of the podocytes. So the membrane, if you are looking at the entire membrane, it is consisting of all these layers, capillary endothelium, basement membrane, food process of the uh, podocytes. So all these three things contribute to the filtration membrane. So that means when the filtrate has to pass from this direction, it has to cross all these barriers and then enter into the Bowman's capsule. That means first is it has to go through the fenestrated pore, then it has to cross the basement membrane, then it has to cross the pore between the food process of the podocyte. So this food process of the podocytes are extensions of the Bowman's capsule. So both the Bowman's capsule and capillary together, it will be contributing to the filtrating membrane. So that is why not every substance will be allowed to pass through the filtration. There are specific substances which can only pass through the filtrate. So at ultimately at the filtrate, in the filtrate, all cells, you don't get any cells, the proteins, you will not be seeing any of the proteins. Then we will be having certain ions in it and you will be having most of it is fluid, right? So that is a selectively permeable membrane. Water and some solutes pass from blood into the capsular space of the nephrons. So that is what is seen. Now let us go through the factors that determine the glomerular filterability. It depends upon the molecular weight of the substance and the charge of the molecule. If you have high molecular weight substances, it is restricted, it will not be allowed to pass through the filtration barrier. It also depends upon the charge of the molecule. As I mentioned before, the basement membrane is highly negatively charged. So if a negatively charged ion try to cross the barrier, it will be repelled. So definitely it will be favoring only positively charged ion with low molecular weight. So small molecules pass through such as water, electrolytes, glucose, amino acids, nitrogenous wastes, vitamins, etc. will easily pass through it. But here glucose, even though it is filtered, Later, it is 100% reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Normally, RBCs and plasma proteins are not filtered. Glomerular filtration occurs as the fluid moves across the glomerular capillary in response to the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure is the pressure which is created within the blood as a result or the pressure generated by the heart itself, that is the hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure. Blood enters the glomerular capillary and then filters out the renal corpuscle. Large proteins and cells stay behind. So that's what in the previous slide also mentions that because it is having a restriction of the molecular weight, it is having a restriction of the charge. So based on the molecular weight, based on the charge, it will decide who will be allowed to pass through this membrane. Glomerular filtration, filtrate will be 
the plasma like fluid in the glomerulus the mechanism is the bulk flow the direction of movement from glomerular capillary to the capsular space that is the direction of movement of the filtrate is from the glomerular capillary into the capsular floors and the space and the driving force for this is the pressure gradient the net filtration pressure that means the pressure gradient between the capillary glomerular capillary and the pressure gradient between the bowman's capsule suppose the pressure within the bowman's capsule is very high that means the filtration will be opposed filtration will not take place much so that gradient is very important it is the one or the determinant force that will be moving the filtration from the glomerular capillaries to the bowman's capsule types of pressures is very important to know first let us see the capillary blood pressure or the hydrostatic pressure so that is the pressure which is exerted within the capillaries and it is actually the general blood pressure what is created by the heart and this favors filtration and this kind of force is an out driving force it moves the fluid outside so if you are imagining a capillary with the blood inside if you have high hydrostatic pressure it can move the fluid out of the capillary fluid diffusion can take place outside the capillary then we have another force which is called as a blood colloidal osmotic pressure cop and colloidal osmotic pressure is exerted by the colloids within the blood the major colloid in the blood is the albumin so if you have more plasma albumin then you you can say that the colloidal osmotic pressure is more capsular hydrostatic pressure when the pressure within the capsule bowman's capsule so if the bowman's capsule has a larger pressure that will be acting as an opposing force for the filtration so we will see this one by one when you look at the picture your ideas becomes more clear now this is very important to understand the concept first let us see the capillary blood pressure so we are talking about the capillary blood pressure or the capillary hydrostatic pressure right so it is written as blood bp so it can be called as a hydrostatic pressure within the capillary so that is what is that pressure and how it is developed it is just as a normal blood pressure the heart will be generating that pressure and then it will be uh, seen as the hydrostatic pressure right so that is the pressure within the blood vessel so this what kind of pressure is this this is an out driving force it can move the fluid outside it is causing more filtration to occur right from the capillary more filtration will occur if, if the pressure here inside increases hydrostatic pressure increases it can push the fluid and filtration can occur so it favors the filtration colloidal osmotic pressure colloidal osmotic pressure is the osmotic pressure which is developed within the blood as a result of the colloids so i told that albumin is the major contributor for the colloidal osmotic pressure this kind of pressure can or is having always the tendency to hold water right it can colloidal osmotic pressure when it increases that means it can hold the water it can drag the water closer it will not it is a kind of a water loving so that means it will hold the water or drag the water so here if you see this pressure the colloidal osmotic pressure inside the this particular capillary it will be opposing the filtration because filtration will be taking place in this direction but here this force is a force which can always hold the water or drag the water so it will be a force in this direction that is why this is always an opposing force colloidal osmotic pressure is an opposing force colloidal osmotic pressure within the capillaries will be an opposing force then capsular pressure right capsular pressure we are talking about the hydrostatic pressure within the bowman's capsule 
right? So here, if you have more of hydrostatic pressure, to which direction this will be acting? Of course, this will be acting in this direction, right? It is opposing the filtration. If you increase the colloid, the hydrostatic pressure within the Bowman's capsule, definitely it will increase the opposing force. Opposing forces. So these two arrows indicates they are opposing forces for the filtration. And this arrow indicates, the downward arrow indicates that it is favoring the filtration. So here you can see that the capillary blood pressure or the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerular capillary will favor the filtration, whereas colloidal osmotic pressure within the capillaries will oppose the filtration. Then the hydrostatic pressure or the capsular pressure in the Bowman's capsule will also oppose the filtration. Filtration pressure. The net force promoting filtration is filtration pressure higher than capillary blood pressure elsewhere in the body. Result of difference in the diameter of efferent and efferent arteriole. Now here you need to remember this very important concept. This is the efferent arteriole. You see the diameter. See this is more broader, right? The, dil the uh, more dilated. And this is the efferent arteriole. See the size. It is more constricted. That means when blood is entering here, it will be with high pressure. And in this system, the pressure increases in the capillary because there is a constriction. Just like when a garden hose pipe, when you start constricting at one particular point, the pressure before that will be increased. Right? So when you try to constrict a garden pipe, and when you just uh, open the tap in the other side, so wherever you are, the constriction is there, just before the constriction, the, blood, the pressure will be so much high because there is a constriction there. So it is like this. So this particular part, the pressure will be higher. The hydrostatic pressure will be higher and that will cause the filtration. So it is one of the reason for this glomerular capillary ultra filtration because it is done under high pressure one thing is that there is a morphological difference between the efferent and efferent arteriole efferent arteriole being more constricted when compared to the efferent arteriole gfr or glomerular filtration rate is the amount of filtrate produced in the kidney every minute it is 125 ml per minute or 180 liters per day. So these values are important and also very frequently asked in the exams. What is the normal GFR or what is the normal glomerular filtration rate? 125 ml per minute or if you calculate in a, in a day, it is 180 liters per day. Factors that alter filtration pressure change GFR. These include increased renal blood flow. What will happen when blood flow in the kidney increases, renal blood flow? You can expect that the increased GFR will be taking place. When blood flow increases, when blood flow increases here, what will happen is here it's already constricted. This is the efferent arteriole. Efferent arteriole, more blood is entering. Here the pressure will be higher and then the filtration will be taking place. Decrease plasma protein. When plasma protein decreases, you can expect that the colloidal osmotic pressure in the blood decreases. So that will, will be increasing the GFR. Increasing the GFR because colloidal osmotic pressure is an opposing force to the filtration. So if you have low amount of colloidal osmotic pressure, this will be faster right this will be more predominant force so filtration will be taking place so it will be increased gfr glomerular filtration rate will increase and that also causes edema edema is a condition where there is a fluid accumulation in interstitial spaces that is because of the imbalance of the hydrostatic pressure and the colloidal osmotic pressure so colloidal osmotic pressure whenever it is low so usually colloidal osmotic pressure is the one which will be helping the fluid to keep or to maintain or to remain within the capillaries. 
If you don't have the colloidal osmotic pressure, more fluid will be leaving out of the capillaries and it will be accumulated into the interstitial space and that can result in edema. One of the most important clinical point which I would like to highlight here is the plasma protein. When there is a reduction in the plasma protein, there is in, in which situation you can think of a reduction in the plasma protein. You know that the plasma proteins are produced by the liver, right? So if the person is having a liver failure, if the subject is having a liver failure, liver failure results in reduced plasma protein production. When plasma protein becomes low, what will happen is there will be increased GFR because when the plasma protein is low, colloidal osmotic pressure is low, then the opposing force is not there, then the filtration will be taking place more. So GFR is more. Ultimately, these patients will be showing signs and symptoms of edema because inside their blood capillaries, the blood will not be able to keep it for long. So many of the fluid part of the blood will be oozing out of the capillaries because it is having less amount of plasma proteins to hold the water content of the blood. Right? So that is the reason. So it will get accumulated and that results in edema. Hemorrhage. When there is a loss of the blood, hemorrhage decrease capillary blood pressure. So hydrostatic pressure in the capillary when it is low, like in the case of a hemorrhage, you can expect that the GFR is low. So these points are very, very important. It is complete concept. So remember, don't just memorize. You need to just understand what is written. The glomerular filtration rate must be precisely controlled. If the GFR is too high, it causes an increase in urine output. There is a threat of dehydration and electrolyte depletion. So you can see that in GFR, if the filtration is taking place too much, what will happen is not enough substances will be reabsorbed because this is also having a limit when too much of load is coming, everything cannot be reabsorbed. So it will be many of the content will be lost, water content will be lost and that will result in dehydration and also electrolyte depletion. If the GFR is too low, what will happen is there will be insufficient excretion of waste. That means enough of filtration is not taking place. That means most of the materials will still remain inside the bloodstream. It will be going circulating in the blood like this. So that is the reason. So if the GFR is one important thing that will be making sure about the filtration process. The only way to adjust GFR from moment to moment is to change the glomerular blood pressure. So blood pressure is playing a very important role or a precise role in controlling the GFR. That is why kidney is considered to be a very important organ. So renal failure is usually fatal unless you treat it that particular patient by a kidney transplantation you cannot save his life. The only thing you, you can do is extend his life by artificial kidney like dialysis and things like that but it will not it's not a permanent solution it's only a temporary solution the only thing which you want to treat a patient or cure a patient completely the only way is a renal transplantation renal autoregulation it is the ability of the kidney to maintain a relatively stable GFR in spite of the changes in the blood pressure. So if the arterial blood pressure, if it is elevated, if it is uh, now here, the range is given as 75 to 175 millimeters of mercury. Within this range, even if it is changing from 75, it has become 80 or 100 or 175. A long range is there. Within this range, even if the arterial blood pressure changes, the variations in the arterial blood pressure is not going to alter the GFR because of the renal autoregulatory mechanism. So if you just see one example, in the initial part, you're seeing that 
when the blood pressure, the, this is mean arterial blood pressure, is plotted against the GFR. So when the arterial pressure increases, GFR also increases. But when, when it reaches a particular stage, in this graph it is shown as from 80 to 160. That's so here it is 80 to 160 in this picture, but here it is mentioned 75 to 1. Uh, 75 to 175 so that can be considered as a range right between 75 to 175 you can put it as a range because different books will give different values but what is important is just to know that within a, a wide range like from 80 from 80 to 160 or 175 you will see that the GFR remains constant the GFR is not increasing it is remaining constant right so that is important so after that when the pressure increases further gfr increase now the mechanism is considered that there are two mechanisms involved here the myogenic response and the tubular tubulo glomerular feedback which we will be explaining one by one later now the myogenic response the nephron has two ways to prevent drastic changes in the GFR when the blood pressure increases. One way it can do is it can constrict the efferent arteriole. Efferent arteriole is the arteriole through which the blood enters into the glomerulus. Right, So that is already having a larger diameter. So that will be constricted. So that will be constriction of the efferent arteriole will reduce the blood into the glomerulus. So when less blood is coming into the glomerulus, definitely the filtration will be lower. Another way which we can do is a dilation of the efferent arteriole. Normally, we have seen that the efferent arteriole is constricted. It's a constricted one when compared to the efferent. But if you dilate the efferent arteriole, it can allow more amount of blood to go through it. That means the pressure it will reduce the pressure there and then it can also regulate the GFR. But a change in the opposite direction will happen if the blood pressure falls. If there is a condition where the blood, blood pressure is low, what will happen is this, this will be dilated. Instead of constriction, this will be dilated. So efferent arteriole will dilate. That means more blood will be entering into the glomerulus and also there will be constriction of the efferent arteriole. So efferent arteriole, if it is constricted, you can expect that more pressure will be seen within the glomerular capillaries. So that is how the myogenic response, because it is due to the smooth muscles present on the arteriole's myogenic. Myo refers to the muscles. So here, smooth muscles plays an important role in this regulation. This is a structure of a juxta glomerular apparatus. In the juxta glomerular apparatus, you can see that this is the efferent arteriole which is bringing the blood and then a tuft of capillary which is the glomerulus. Then we have the efferent arterioles which is taking the blood outside the uh, glomerulus. And before we have seen in the first picture when we discussed about the nephron, the distal convoluted tubule or distal tubule, right, this part, this part, distal tubule will be passing through the efferent and efferent arterial. You see, between efferent and efferent, it will be passing through like this. See here, in this particular picture, this is the proximal tubule, PCT. Then you have the loop of Henle. Then loop of Henle is coming. And after that, this will be the DCT or distal convoluted tubule. So DCT is passing through in between the efferent and efferent arteriole. This is the efferent arteriole and this is the efferent arteriole. So between that, when it is passing, it touches that and make a modification in its cells. Right. So this whole structure, whole structure is considered to be the juxta glomerular apparatus. And we will see what is its precise functions. When the distal tubule passes between the efferent and efferent arteriole of its own glomerulus, a combination of macula densa and juxta glomerular cells is known as juxta glomerular 
apparatus. Juxtaglomenular cells or JG cells are modified cells of the efferent arteriole, which is responsible for the secretion of renin. It's very important. So if you see in that particular picture, the efferent arteriole is having cells, modified cells, and that they can they are called as a JG cells. So JG cells are the one which is responsible for secretion of renin which is having a very important role in the blood pressure regulation. Macula densa, if you see the cells inside the DCT, which is in close communication between the efferent and efferent arteriole, that is a modified cell in the DCT, that particular part where it touches to this efferent and efferent arteriole, that part of the DCT is modified and those cells are called as a macula densa which can sense the amount of sodium and chloride load reaching the DCT, which means these macula denser cells are specific sensors which can sense the amount of sodium and chloride which is reaching the DCT. So they will be acting like sensors that can sense the amount of sodium and chloride which is coming to, to the DCT or distal convoluted tubule. Mesangial cells, in between you will be seeing certain mesangial cells, they have phagocytic functions and contractile properties. So mesangial cells will be seen throughout the glomerular capillary in between the glomerular capillaries. So they have phagocytic functions and contractile property. When they contract, it can change or change the flow of blood through each of these capillaries. So it can actually affect the capillary blood flow. When it is contracted, maybe some of the capillaries might remain contract. That means it can, uh, it can decrease the amount of blood which is flowing through the capillary. So it will be having an important role to regulate the GFR. They also influence the capillary filtration by regulating the pore size on the filtrating membrane. This is also an important concept. When the pore sizes can be altered, According to various stimulus, when the mesangial cells contract or relax, the pore sizes can be adjusted. That means if pore sizes are larger, more substances can be filtered. If the pore sizes is lesser, then you can see that the, uh, this particular part, uh, like uh, the filtration is affected. So like that, it can regulate. Now let us talk on the tubulo glomerular feedback which is the second point which we uh, mentioned when we discussed about the autoregulation the renal autoregulation tubulo glomerular feedback mechanism whenever the systemic arterial pressure increases the renal arterial pressure is also increased because the systemic pressure when it increases the renal arterial pressure increase the more blood will be flowing through the efferent arteriole so the efferent arteriolar pressure will increase then the glomerular capillary pressure will increase because more amount of blood is entering into the kidney so of course in this part capillary also the pressure will be increased thereby gfr will be increased gfr means filtration glomerular filtration when more gfr happens the distal delivery of sodium and chloride is also increased because more amount of filtrate if it is passing that filtrate will be having so much of sodium and so much of chloride so this will be sensed by the macula densa cells in the dct right in the juxta glomerular apparatus when we saw we saw a cell called macula densa which are acting as sensors for the sodium and chloride so it will be sensing large amount of sodium and chloride which is coming into the dct as a result increase our efferent arteriolar contraction will happen efferent arteriole will start contracting this will contract what will happen if this constrict less blood will be entering that means the gfr will be flow uh, less becoming less right so here you can see efferent arteriolar contraction will happen then the glomerular capillary pressure falls because when less amount of blood enters the pressure here will be lower and as a result the gfr is 
minimized. So this is a kind of a tubular glomerular feedback regulation. So it is initiated by the amount of substance reaching the tubules. What is that substance? The load is the sodium and the chloride and it is sensed by the macular denser cell and appropriate in, uh, like uh, instructions is given, appropriate stimulus is given to bring, bring about this particular mechanism. Let us see the neural regulation of GFR. Sympathetic nerve fibers innervates both efferent and efferent arteriole. Normally, sympathetic stimulation is low, but it can be increased during conditions like hemorrhage or exercise. Vasoconstriction occurs as a result. What will happen is there will be conservation of the blood volume and permits greater blood, blood flow to the other parts of the body. Right, so vasoconstriction. So here, what is seen is during hemorrhage, you can see during hemorrhage, the extracellular fluid volume is decreased. Right, as a result, the mean arterial pressure is also low, MAP, mean arterial pressure is low. And in the cardiovascular system, we have learned about the baroreceptors, which are the stretch receptors. So stretch receptors will be activated, which, which will be uh, stimulated in a lesser extent because it is less main arterial blood pressure so it is less stretching of the baroreceptors then the sympathetic nervous system will be active how because from the baroreceptors we have also already learned that the inputs are going to the medulla the inputs are going to the medulla right so it will be going to the vasomotor centers the cardiovascular centers and then it will be stimulating the sympathetic nervous system and when sympathetic nervous system increase the stimulation increases it will be input to the efferent arteriole and as a result efferent arteriole will constrict and when efferent arterioles are constricted the gfr will be low so that is low so here this is a case of hemorrhage so we don't want the blood to go into the kidney and cause too much of GFR and urine formation. So in this case, the less amount of blood, already the body is having a less amount of blood. So this blood is channelized towards the vital organs. So this is what written here you can see occurs, vasoconstriction occurs in the kidney. As a result, it conserves the blood and permits greater blood flow to the other parts. Like for example, to the brain, to the heart, all those areas we want more blood supply at the time of hemorrhage. So these are considered as vital organs. So kidney in the kidney, you will be seeing that the blood flow is reduced during this emergency situations like in the case of hemorrhage. Now let us see the hormonal regulation of GFR. Several hormones contribute to the GFR regulation. One hormone, angiotensin II, which is activated by renin and released by the JG cells. It is considered to be a potent vasoconstrictor and that can reduce the GFR. The second hormone, atrial natriuretic peptide or ANP, which is released by atria when they are stretched. Remember, Atrial natriuretic peptide or ANP is released only during high blood volume because it has to be released as a result of atrial stretching. When they are stretched, it increases the GFR by increasing the capillary surface area available for filtration. So these are some of the hormones which is involved in the GFR regulation. So here you can see that arterial baroreceptors sensing decreased blood pressure then the sympathetic nervous system will be active when the sympathetic nervous system is active juxtaglomerular apparatus will be also active then it will be stimulating the release of renin then the renin angiotensin mechanism will happen and finally angiotensin 2 will be produced then it will be also releasing increased aldosterone and aldosterone will bring about increased sodium reabsorption in the distal nephrons 
sodium is retained, water is retained, ECF volume is regulated. So this is a cyclical pattern or how the hormone will be interacting. GFR or glomerular filtration rate is the volume of plasma filtered per unit time by all nephrons in both kidney. Approximately 180 liters per day or 125 ml per minute. Urine output is about 1 to 2 liters per day. About 99% of the filtrate is reabsorbed. These are the references and we will be again having one session on the renal physiology 1 and 2 together for your questions, clarifications and further discussions. Thank you for listening.